as promised, we're we're not stopping the uh, the knowledge and the information that's coming through today on the Beat Stars 2020 Summit. Just to remind everybody, these will be archived on Beat Stars World www.beatstars.world. Click on on that website uh, to learn everything that's going on with Beat Stars because it's more than just selling beats online. Uh, there's the distribution service. There's the publishing admin service. There are the racial justice initiatives. There's a whole lot going on. There's there's Music Entrepreneur Club, which happens every Monday and Thursday, and that's free. And it's interactive conversations such as these ones with professionals in the music business. Um, here's the other thing, too. Uh, please, please network in the chat. And in addition to networking in the chat, ask questions. The last conversation we had with Young Guru and just the engineer was was very question driven. So um, those those questions that you asked, I tried to, to um, relate to the panelists. Today's panel, we're, we're focusing on the legal side of the music business, specifically as it relates to you as producers. And so it's going to be a dense conversation. And that's why the replay is going to be of some value. And that's why I would like everybody to um, also Ask questions throughout in, in case there's any um, confusion. <laughs> Let's start this this very dense and very serious conversation that should not be uh, punctuated with laughter or jokes about my voice. Um, cool. I, let me let me start off by uh, running through a scenario that I had recently. And Othello, tell me if you've experienced this as well. It was a really frustrating co uh, conversation that I had with a. A uh, rapper who purchased some of my beats, um, non-exclusively, and you know I want to provide good customer service and have good conversation. Um, I felt like this situation got out of hand in a way that I couldn't control, and it was that they licensed my beats. Somebody else has licensed the beats prior, and you know of course in the Beat Stars contract, they they prohibit uploading those beats through some kind of content ID service. Yeah. Um, be because when you do that, what you're effectively doing is saying you own the entire song, beat included. And mm -hmm. if you don't own the beat and the producer still owns the beat, what ends up happening is you're claiming beat ownership and therefore you're claiming copyright of any other person who uses that beat and tries to upload that beat to a, a distributor. Now that's what happened. And the person contacted me was very angry and they said, you know, this isn't your beat. Someone else owns the beat already. They're they're copyright claiming me, and I think it's it's really a jarring thing for a person to experience, especially if they've never experienced it before. When someone files a copyright claim against them, it feels like a really serious legal matter, um, even though it's not necessarily. And in this case, it wasn't. Uh, but anyway, I'm trying to explain this conversation you know, to him and saying, you know, I didn't, I didn't claim it against you. I actually had nothing to do with this. The, 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 the individual who's claiming they own this beat is actually claiming it incorrectly and they're infringing on my copyright and they're infringing on yours. Yeah. However, I can't control that. And so it became, I mean, I was getting like, this is my fault for putting my phone number, um, my business phone number online. I was getting like 10 calls all afternoon by multiple parties and people were just mad. I'm like, it's an ugly scenario because now I'm beefing with the, not beefing, but like I'm not having a pleasant conversation with this artist because yeah. they're accusing me of something I had nothing to do with. And all the, you know, all of this could have been solved if the content ID systems and the CMS systems on the internet could just, you know, anticipate and accommodate the current state of the music business, which is that beat leasing is a major part of the landscape. Have you experienced something like that, Othello? Oh, yeah, I do. All the time, actually. They'll be like, uh, I bought the beat. Like, um, like they, they, and then someone, yeah, they'll get the copyright. And I'm like, I get the copyright, too, because, like, even if I post the beat, you know, I get an uh, email from YouTube saying, like, I'm getting a copyright claim. So I'm just like, you just have to dispute it. And then um, if they add, just send a, a copy of the receipt, you know, that's like the best I can do at that point. And exactly. And I advised them to do that. But it's also it, it's frustrating because it 
reflects poorly on us and makes us look like we're selling you know licenses to material we don't own that kind of thing uh -huh. so is this is this something that you've ever dealt with or had to deal with or or have had conversations about carl as a as a attorney um not so much i mean i think uh i think that's really in the weeds like uh, you know, by the time it gets to me, or you know, one of my clients is asking me about, um, you know, like something's getting caught up in the content ID system. It's it's literally, um, as you guys kind of point out, it's systematic changes that we need. Um, you know that, that that you know these tech companies need to sort of integrate to sort of help everyone out. But you know, at this point, it's sort of whack a mole. You know, if that that situation happens, you got to just submit. The proper documentation, like Odello said, you know, send over a receipt, um, whatever it is that, or, or the contract or lease that shows that, um, you know, these rights are allocated to this person, and yet I still have my rights to, to also monetize on my channel. Um, but but as you guys both, DJ Pan, as you as you started off by saying, um, you know, it, it's something that the game is, hasn't caught up to. Technology isn't sort of proactive in this sense. So do you do you see the music business and the technology that runs it as a whole becoming more accommodating to beat leases in the future, or do you think that things are going to become, I guess, more restrictive, more regressive, and we're just going to have to fight a little harder? Yeah, I mean, I would say more, definitely more um, rigid. I think you know Europe sort of is leading the charge. I think in a little bit more um, aggressive intellectual property enforcement tactics, like, um, you know, just putting more emphasis on, um, you know, uh, the, the DSPs, the YouTubes, the Spotify's, the Apple Musics, those people have, to have better protocol in place to stop copyright infringement or stop the abuse of copyright infringement. Right now, it's pretty much a system where, you know, you're alleging that someone copied your beat or someone copied your song or you don't have the rights to that song. So you're filing your, um, you're, you're filing your infringement and um, Spotify or YouTube is answering that infringement, but there's going to be stronger protocols in place. So, you know, if anything, I think it's going to be a little bit more rigid standpoint. And I think everyone should um, keep, keep that in mind when they're sort of creating these leasing documents and um, they're giving away their beats. So what are some ways that producers can anticipate? So let, let's yeah. say things get worse and more restrictive for producers and, and artists who are licensing beats online. What are some ways that, that we as producers can accommodate and anticipate those changes? You know, I don't like the leasing where, you know, it's tied to some sort of like milestone, like if it hits 5,000 stream, I, I think you have to make it easier on, on yourself. Um, I, I think, um, Ideally, there'd be less beat leases and more probably sales. Like, uh, I guess maybe ideally, um, but but right now that the, the the landscape is, um, you know, it, it is what it is. I think I think what producers can do is um, try not to over lease beats and stuff like that. I mean, there's there's some songs right now or leases out there where there's like 400 leases, and it's like, man, I, that that's going to be pretty that's going to be pretty crazy trying to enforce that or keeping up with those leases. So I think, I think it's really just about like, uh, you know, maybe putting a cap on how many beats you lease to a certain pe person, uh, to certain people, just so you know where these beats are going. Like, I think it's, I think it's really about that knowing where all this stuff's going. So here's a, here's a question for both of you. Um, I want to ask you Othello first and then Carl second. Um, what would you say is very generally, what would you say is the most pressing legal matter for today's beat maker? Pressing matter. Uh, I guess. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me good? Because they're saying I was low in the uh, comments. I I, I hear you. you well, yeah, but they're right. also saying I sound like Paul Wall, so I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, uh, maybe like stuff like samples when it comes to samples and um. People hit me all the time. They're like, yo, when it comes to sampling beat, like music, 
Like, um, how do you get around that? And um, I'm usually just telling them it's up to the artist or the label when they purchase it. That's like the best answer I can give because I've never cleared a sample before, so I can't like you know lie to them and tell them what to do. But uh, yeah, when it comes to that and um, what else? What was your question again? You said legal matters when it comes to producers. Yeah, what what would you say is the biggest well, legal concern things? that's that's you know really affecting us right now? Um, and same thing with the loops, like trying to remake someone's loop or um, yeah, you know, just not crediting another producer, like I think yeah, that's most. yeah. I would say the legal issues are definitely inner inner producer community at this juncture. Um, I think the first thing is sort of what happens when a placement happens, you know, how you guys are breaking down the bread, um, who's taking control of the paperwork, you know, if, if you're a loop, per, if you're, especially if this is your first or second placement and um, you did the loop, but the other producer uh, sort of got the placement and he's like maybe the bigger, uh, more forceful party. Um, what happens there, right? Do you get your own, do you get a chance, to, a chance to get your own sort of paperwork and get your own negotiation? Is that gonna halt things? Is that gonna make this thing very difficult? Um, Cause I, I, I've seen this a bunch of times where a placement was had, a loop maker um, sort of maybe aggressively approached the situation and um you know it, it didn't end up too well for for that person um i think there just has to be more camaraderie in, in the producer community in regards to how you guys are going to break down um uh, the splits when things get placed and then who's going to handle the paperwork if you guys are going to agree like all right look you know if this gets placed you know you'll get your you'll, you'll have your attorney i have my attorney that's fine or maybe you say for this song uh when i place the song we'll just have my attorney do the paperwork and you can get your split um, so it, it just come into these bigger, these bigger things are, and they're hap It's a day-to-day -day thing. It's like, it's happening all the time. So here's a question then, and I'm glad both of you are here because we have the, the legal perspective from an attorney. And then we have the producer perspective from a creative who, uh, you know, I didn't go to law school. I don't think you went to law school with Ella. I maybe you did and I'm wrong, but, no. um, he thinks he did. <laughs> <It's like that. laughs> so, so i just i i interviewed um two two beat stars members uh out in africa um ramoon and ransom and they just did six nines yaya -Ya record and i asked them how they they split and he said you know because they've been collaborating forever through beat stars and what's what's cool about the whole collaboration thing on beat stars is that you really kind of have to already um uh have had that conversation with your uh produce with your co-producers to figure out what the splits are going to be just in beat stars right and mm -hmm. so that kind of helps you prepare to have that conversation once the stakes are a little higher in the I case agree. of a placement now when i asked both of them because they were constantly collaborating um i uh their answer was they they split everything 50 50 when it comes to a placement or when it comes to a beat that they uploaded to beat stars regardless of whether or not one of them feels like maybe they did 60 percent rather than 50 they just do that because they're in it for a long-term relationship what are and for me i've actually adopted that mentality as well for the for my collaborators just because it keeps it easy mm -hmm. um a lot of times, though, like you said, Carl, if it's your first placement or something, you're going to try to get as much out of it as you can. A lot of people can <laughs> try to get as much out of it as they can, and then maybe they burn bridges. And, and so what are some strategies that you've seen work um, with regards to communication between producers? So we're not focusing on the negative, so we're you know really focusing on the, uh, the, the, the positive. I, I think entertainment consumption entertainment business consumption music business consumption online has led people to believe that everyone has equal leverage and i think that is one of the key elements of understanding business understanding what leverage you actually have um just because you think that you um that you know what a copyright is and you know what necessarily the the breakdown of the melody and all this other stuff doesn't mean it's going to that's the way it's going to be and 
Uh, if you have no leverage, you have no placements, you don't have anything um, in your favor that dictates you getting more or what you're asking for, um, I think that is when you start, you know, sounding crazy to people. So I think it's about being real with yourself. You, know, you get your first couple opportunities and looks. Um, there are some producers out there who say, you know, we're going to split everything down the middle and be gracious. You know, I mean, you you just you you that that's a good situation. But there are other producers who feel that um, them spending countless hours in the studio, um, them taking years to build their relationships in the industry. And, you know, when they text over a beat to somebody and a major label artist uses that beat um, and, and, and you might have contributed, you know, a full melody to it. No one's, you know, knocking that contrib contribution. You know, those people think that, you know, you're going to get knocked a little bit on the splits and the advances and stuff like that. Me, personally, I think if all I did was send a loop over and someone else, you know, ha who had, you know, finished the beat and produced it, maybe even got in the studio and use their connections to get get the placement off the ground, I will be more than willing to say, I'm gonna take a smaller piece of this and I'll probably, you know, I'll take a smaller role in the paperwork because um, I didn't have agency over the situation. Um, it's about being realistic and being a business person, literally. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, when it comes to B-Stars, usually I just split everything equally because it's B-Stars, you know, and it's like over the internet. But when it comes to actual placements, that hasn't happened to me yet where I've collaborated with another producer for an actual placement. But like Carl said, whoever, you know, does majority of the work, if I were to just make the loop and, you know, give it a like South Side or something, he gets it placed with like a big artist like Feature, then I would, you know, expect to get less of a percentage, you know, yeah. to be more realistic. Yeah, no, nah, for real. But like, I think, you know, I see stuff on the internet all the time that's like, oh, it needs to be 50 50. Let's split. You know, I argue with uh, one of my clients openly. His name is Andrew, Andrew Porter. Uh, I mean, it was a fun argument. You know, it was all love. Uh, you know, the conversation sort of, you know, took, it was a bigger, I guess, conversation that we wanted to sort of expose. You know, he feels that every time um, a song gets placed, it should be 50 50. And I said, look, I don't know. I I know I talk to a lot of other people in the music business, not just producers. I just, it's just not that's just not how it is and how it's going to be. And I think one day when you spend years building your sort of um, career and production credits and all that other stuff, you're going to be like, why is that dude getting the same as me? I mean, you earn that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's level to this. Like Meek said, like, that's just yeah. what it is. Yeah. I was waiting for a meat quote from the from the Philly dude. Um, so here's here's a big topic that you know hopefully will inspire some conversation. This happens to me all the time. It happened to me, I think, yesterday evening. Um, a lot of a lot of times, as a producer or recording artist, might reach out to you and say, "Hey, I like your beat. I don't want to pay for it, but I'll give you your credits and part of the royalties." From a legal standpoint what is correct or incorrect about that offer? Uh, nothing, as long as there's an aspect that there, what, if this song is picked up by a major label, we can totally renegotiate. Uh, or, you know, you know, I'm not selling away my... Uh, you're you said no publishing, or you said like the full... So for me, you know, I'll have I'll have a recording artist contact me and say, "Hey, I want this beat for free, but in exchange for the free beat, I will give you publishing, or I'll give you, I don't know, part ownership in the master." And I always look at those scenarios like, well, in terms of the law, I technically already own those things, right? So. I think there's this misunderstanding where an exchange of money automatically amounts to an exchange of rights or a transference yeah. of rights. And that's, that's not necessarily true. Right. So what, what kind of, um, I guess what kind of miss would you say surround this topic of, of transference of rights in exchange for, for money, especially when it comes to online beat leasing? Yeah, there, there definitely needs to be an artist education and I think a label education um, because usually it's not so much the producer community that, that's sort of, ah, I think there is still a, still a producer community education yeah. issue. 
Um, but usually it's the artists and the label that are so used to this construct of, they don't even question, I think, the ecosystem at all. So I think they're approaching it like, um, you know, when we <laughs> we get rights, you know, we have the rights. And, and as you sort of alluded, it's like, well, normally what we're doing is we're forfeiting less of what we're already owed for a higher fee or an advance or something like that. That's kind of how, you know, normally it would be 50-50 based on maybe the copyright and, um, you know, the, the way the law is. But, um, you know, when someone else comes in, that's when, you know, it, it gets a little tricky because they're like, no, um, you know, we'll give you your publishing and your royalties. And it's like, well, if you didn't give me any money, um, <laughs> we're probably starting off from a 50-50 standpoint anyway um, on both sides, the master and the, and the publishing. But when you say stuff like, well, I'm going to put a lot of money in for marketing and I'm going to use this record and I have a, a huge following and I'm going to blast this. And I'm, that's when you start saying, OK, cool. You know, maybe, I, you know, I, fine, I might deserve less on the master side because of those reasons. But, sh you know, as you alluded, it should start basically from a 50 50 standpoint. And, um, you know, depending on whatever scenario it is uh, that 50 that 50 percent starts to dwindle down and down. Yeah. You're very stoked right now, though. How do you feel about that? Wait, about what? Sorry, I, was looking, I was looking at the comments. Yeah, they got me distracted. I need to turn these comments off. <laughs> no, I'm this. I'm. I was the same way earlier. I'm like, wait a minute. I have the responsibility to actually moderate this conversation. I just can't yeah. see everybody. What number one? Why is Carl not getting roasted right now? It's just me and Othello. And yeah, someone my keeps goodness saying, gracious. Nah, my, my people respect me, man. This is a, this is a great community. My, my, my people come from, they don't want to mess with the Lord. Uh. A lot of love in here. It's a lot of love in here. They just don't want to get sued. Um. Anyway, uh, <laughs> speaking yeah, of not wanting yeah. to get sued, um, well, let, let me ask this question. So, a, a lot of producers have a lot of fear about releasing music and having their copyright infringed on so a lot of them will just not release beats or mm -hmm. they'll really I th and from my perspective uh overthink the process on a legal side so the question i get all the time and the answer is always you know when you ask the internet a question you'll get a thousand different answers and all of them might be wrong what do producers need to do to ensure that their beats are copyrighted? Because a lot of people want to know where what their protection is. What is what does the law say about that? And and what are some things? So I want to know, Othello, what do you do, and what's your approach to to feeling safe when you're releasing your your music? And and Carl, what what do you say to people who are so concerned about the copyright protection for beats that they that they upload publicly on a youtube or a beat stars platform yeah um, i'll but, be honest i'm not like the most uh educated when it comes to copyright i once heard once you made the content and someone else were to like steal it like your um what's it called like it's your um it's yours so you own it so you can you can uh you can go to court for it but uh what i do to feel protected is i just put my tag throughout the beat like when i put it on youtube so if I were to hear it and um like if I were to hear it playing somewhere, I can easily point out my tag or like one of my friends can because this happens all the times actually. Where uh, I won't get credited, but one of my friends will hear and be like, Yo, this is your beat, and then I go listen and I hear my tag going throughout, and I'm like, Okay, they didn't purchase, so I know to come at them for that, and I know it's mine because I hear my tag throughout. So that's how I basically protect myself, yeah. Uh you know, I'll also add that and say, like, um, half the time, like, you know, Othello being a client, you know, uh, half the time, you know, he'll ask me about how I can sort of, uh, you know, what, what should he do about some of this stuff. And half the time, I'm like, don't waste your time. You have better things to do than, than play whack-a-mole uh, the rest of your life. Um, and even with filing copyright, how many beats do you make a day, Othello? And how many beats do you have up on on BeatStars and, and YouTube? Like five a day, and on B stars, I have like almost three hundred. Right, it's like you know, it'd be, it'd be crazy to file um, copyrights, even if that it's just not practical. So what, what 
you got to know what's worth it. I think you just have to have an eye on the landscape, what's going on, who's using your stuff. And I think there's a, there's a point where you say, I'm going to exercise control over my copyright on certain parts. But for the most part, um, playing whack-a-mole is probably not the best uh, use of your time, um, you know, in, in, until it is. Mm -hmm. So what rights do, yeah, what rights do a, do a producer have when they create a beat and publish it without going through the whole copyright registration process? What rights do they have? Yeah, I mean, they, they have the right to monetize it. They have the right to, the right to sell it um, and sell certain rights, right? You know, I think that's kind of how you have to use, how you have to think about it. Like, um, you created this beat, and now I could sell it for a certain amount of money, but retain certain control over it if I want to resell it, or I want to give it away exclusively. But in those moments when you give it away exclusively, um, you're still owed money um, and um, you're still old royalties unless you give those away, and you should never get tricked into um, believing that someone's gifting you publishing or gifting you uh, a master royalty because you're, you're owed that by law. Um, so it's a, at that at the, at this point, it's about how much am I getting? Not, and and I, it goes back to what I said earlier about starting in your mind from that fifty fifty place from on both sides of the equation on the master side when you're dealing with in so-called producer points and then when also you're talking about the publishing you know publishing is pretty a lot easier i guess to sort of um talk about just because it usually starts everyone pretty much understands that the production side is 50 percent and the songwriting side is 50 percent so it's easy right there uh the master role who um uh, that that's the biggest issue and i don't want to run on too much longer but one thing i will say is there's a reason why that is. Um, a song is streaming and close to 57 cents. A song is streaming and say dollars generated. 57% goes to whoever owns the math board. So 57% is already going to the math board. Around 30% stays with the DSP, meaning Apple, uh, Spotify, uh, whoever it is. Around 13% is left on the publishing side. And as we know, um, streaming is super, super important for the for both sides of the ecosystem. Um, and that's just the way things are negotiated. There's a lot more money on the mass recording side than there is on the publishing side. So I think keep that in mind when you're arguing and you're trying to, when we carve out, I think all of us as a community have to understand where the money is and we should be trying to carve out more space on the master side. So quick question. A lot of, a lot of people are saying, um, Carl, that you're, uh, your mic is is echoing back. I don't know if you have a headset or something that might fix it. Yeah, let me let me grab my let me grab my uh, headset. No doubt. So so I think that's an important entry point for for another conversation. So let let's break this down because this is something that a lot of people just don't understand about streaming. So I'll hear a lot of people say, "I want my streaming royalties." And I should wait till Carl comes back. Um, Othello, what what are what are your thoughts about uh, what Carl just said? Yeah, when it comes to streaming, uh, yeah, I really don't know the numbers like that. I'm still trying to understand, but uh, I'm not like super educated when it comes to those numbers. I just always so, heard that like there's not much money when it comes to streaming unless it's a hit. That's all I really know. <laughs> Yeah, and that's one of those things that's, I'll put it this way, um, I, I feel great when a recording artist who licenses my beats sends me some kind of email asking about, you know, my IPI numbers or whatever email I, they can enter in, you know, distributor uh, splits in. Because it's like, I know that I, I will, pro come on, man, the echo's not coming from my headphones, that's ridiculous. Uh, cause I, cause I know that chances are the, um, the, what was I going to say? The, um, the royalties aren't going to be that crazy, but at the same time, you never know. So, you know, even if a hundred people register and a hundred people make, you know, $3 off of a song every, 
Uh, I know this this damn chat. No, he said about your heart beating. <laughs> yeah. My 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 point is, it will it will add up. Um, yeah. So Carl, <laughs> said the, this dude's an asshole. The mic is echoing off my bald ass head. <laughs> this is whatever. Um. So. <laughs> To to kind of recap what what Carl was saying about streaming royalties, a lot of people will focus on streaming royalties as though it's this monolithic thing, like there's only one source of of streaming royalties, and the standard streaming royalty, like let's say Spotify, which I guess is considered an interactive stream, mm-hmm. generates. Cor- please correct me if I'm wrong, Carl. I think just a general interactive streaming royalty generates three different types of royalties. One on the master side, one on the mechanical side, and one on the performance side. Correct. Okay. I feel like I'm I'm about to pass the bar. So um, the majority of it goes to whoever owns the master. And usually that's in, in a major label situation, the label usually owns the master. And so that's why a lot of people will say well, streaming can't get you any money because they're looking at the majors and they're seeing how little the artists get. If you're independent, it's a little different. If you're independent and say you produce the beat yourself and it's your song, you're getting a good amount of money per stream. If you're not getting that many streams, it doesn't matter, right? But if if you are getting a bunch of streams, then you're good. And if you own the master because you're unsigned or whatever, then you're then you're really making the majority of the money. Um, s- the problem is all of these. Di- so and then there's also a non-interactive. Um, stream which now touches on sound exchange royalties and doesn't pay a performance royalty so i don't you know a lot of us don't understand that and so when we're talking about collecting our royalties things get crazy because um it's such a convoluted process so can you break down carl how a, a producer even is able to collect on these these royalties what do they need to do how do they need to register how do they need to claim you know for a standard royalty how can they claim their money on the master side how can they claim their money on the performance side how can they claim their money on the mechanical side yeah um once So someone's already asking in the chat, what about HFA, which is short for Harry Fox Agency, and um, that's that's part of the conversation. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Yep. I don't think my my headphones are connected just yet, so excuse the echo. Uh, you just give me one second, Pam. I'm trying to. Uh, well, what was your, you said about um for me yeah I so f- for you but so just in a general sense how do you communicate this with artists because that's that's a hard topic to discuss because a lot yeah. of times if someone gets a beat from us we don't necessarily even know if they put it out mm-hmm. uh for me i remember i asked mike this from beat stars like because people were asking me about publishing when it comes to uh leasing the beat and I, I asked him because I was confused on that. Because in the contract, I'm pretty sure it says like we keep, producers keep 100% in the publishing, right? And um, I kind of hear echo too. But yeah, so when it comes to the publishing, I'm pretty sure that we keep 100% and uh, when it come, when they lease, but when they buy it exclusive, that's when you know it's necessary to negotiate like a you know like a percentage for the publishing. Otherwise, though, like I don't. Yeah, so that's a good conversation to have with with a, a lawyer who actually knows what um, these things all mean, and that's a com- that, that's a question that's being asked uh, in the chat as well. So keep the questions coming because I'm I'm taking note of these questions and I'm I'm definitely uh, not ignoring them. I'm just trying to find a, a perfect time to uh, bring them up to to our panelists.
So, okay, here's another question then for you, Othello. Um, Mm -hmm. When people contact you, uh, what kinds of conversations do you have with them, with with customers who have questions about splits? Because a lot of people, producers included, and I think that's a a major problem, don't necessarily understand the terms of of their... uh, beat sales either and so if they don't understand them and their customers don't understand them that conversation can get really confusing so what are what are some types of conversations or what are some ways that you have these conversations with the uh customers that purchase your your beats when it comes to splits right when it comes to anything splits royalty collection so forth uh it's not too many times I get asked about the splits, but when I do, like I said, they'll be like in the contract it says uh you keep 100% publishing. And I'm like, yeah, because you're only leasing the beat. You know, it makes sense. I didn't understand it at first either. At first I was giving them half of that publishing cuz I'm like I didn't understand, but when Mike explained it and he said that um yeah, that's how it's supposed to be cuz they're just leasing it. It's not exclusive. You keep all the publishing. So when they ask, I'm usually like, yeah, I, I'm. that's how it's supposed to be. If you want to take part of the uh, publishing, you just have to purchase exclusive, which I usually don't do as well, unless, you know, it's a good song. So, uh, Carl, how is it? Are you all good? Yeah, I'm good. I, I just don't know. There's going to be a bad echo, but it is what it is. Okay, cool. Um, oh, here's a great question. How would you ideally approach an artist who, quote, stole, unquote, your beat and the song is gaining traction? So if, if you catch, you talked about this, Othello, earlier. You'll, you know, you'll have a friend tell you, hey, someone's using your beat. Your tags aren't in it. Um, they didn't pay for it, obviously. How do you approach them in order to make the best uh, of that situation? Usually, I'll hit them up, the artist. Well, like Carl says, some songs, like, if they're not even buzzing, like, I don't even waste my time. But um, if it is, I'll just hit them up and be like, I remember there was just one instance, actually, there's this Philly rapper, and he used my beat for an intro, and they credited another producer mm. as a producer, so I had to hit them up, and uh, I was just polite about it, you know? I was like, hey, it was me that made this beat, you know, um... I was just like what I deserve, you know, the 50 percent and just the credit. And, you know, I'm just polite about it. I don't ever, you know, snap on the first instance. You know, I like Carl do that if he needs to. But uh, like I said, I always try to keep the good relationship and I just come off polite, you know, ask for what I deserve. Because like Carl said, too, like it is what you deserve. It's not like I'm asking for anything. So you yeah. it sounds like you've hired Carl for things before. Yeah, for sure. And what? You know, here's what I'll say. I'll say I'm a business minded attorney. Like, um, I'm, I don't, I think there's like, I think there's definitely two types of attorneys um, out there. I think Adam Friedman, for example, who's a buddy, um, you know, I, Adam will go to extreme lengths to, I, I think, one, prove a point, and two, sort of, uh, you know, just, just try to get things done. Me, for example, uh, you know, it, it's always a cause benefit analysis. You can't spend too much time emotionally uh, on money, um, you know, on all that stuff. And you you run up a legal bill over, you know, a thousand dollars. You know, it, it's, it's not worth it. It has to be worth it. So before you go to your stakeholders, your people, um, and you say, you know, let's address this. It's not that big of a deal. So, you know, I think when someone's using your beat, probably feel probably feel good, um, but also um, don't don't run it don't run it up, man. On your side, don't call your lawyer uh, about stupid issues or small things because then I'm gonna have to stop answering. Or if someone else, it's like, oh, there's not that much money involved, and I think that should be. Um, your sort of meter, like how much is this? What's the cause benefit analysis? Yeah. So here's here's a question then. Um, what steps can a producer take 
to address, say, a, a copyright infringement on their part where there is no compromise, but you don't have to go all the way over to the point of harassing a, a lawyer for that. Are, are there legal remedies for a producer? I mean, besides the takedown, which you can file yourself, you know, you could just copyright, um, you know, go, go to Spotify, Apple Music, uh, all the platforms and file for sort of just a copyright infringement. Like I didn't get paid for my beat and this wasn't authorized and, you know, this has to come down. You could do that. Um, you could register the song and ask at BMI and just try to collect what you can collect to sort of, um, you know, make sure that you're getting something out of the zone. You know, in particular, if it starts picking up. Um, same thing with, uh, you know, if, the, if, if that person, you got to ask who that person is releasing the music from. Is if he's doing Distro Kid? You know, I know District Distro Kid allows you to sort of send a link directly to, you know, other stakeholders and allows you to connect, collect uh, master royalties. So. Um, I just, I think have a real plan of action. And I think sometimes people just get emotional and just reach out to these parties and start acting crazy and don't even know what they even want out of this. Like, what do you want? Is it is a thousand dollars going to make you stop? Even then it's like, is a thousand dollars worth more than 50% of the master and 50% of the pub? You know, it, it has to make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, in my experience, I've never actually the the old me was really frustrated with that kind of thing. So when it happened, I would get emotional about it and and you know send a, a strongly worded um, email. But nowadays, if I see it happening, I just assume that a who you know a rapper just doesn't know any better, and so they think they can just do this. So I'll just contact them and be like, "Yeah, oh, this is this is the deal." Can we handle it? I'm not trying to beat you over the head with anything. I'll even maybe drop the price of a, of a lease. Just just deal with it, and we can move on. Um, and then, you know, something that, that BeatStars is bringing up in the chat is that BeatStars distribution allows you to add collaborators, so they have the, the splits there. So if we're talking about, let's go back to the conversation about um, streaming royalties. If you give someone a split, say, with, with BeatStars, that's a master royalty split, which is the majority of, a, of, of what s streaming generates. Um, so already you're, you're covering most of, of your royalties. Now, um, w with regards to all of the royalties that are involved in a stream, I, before we had the technical problems, which are, were probably my fault and I apologize, um, we were discussing the three kinds of royalties that are generated every time a regular you know interactive stream on on say spotify apple music title uh you know what what three royalties those streams generate and carl you said master takes up the majority at about 57 percent correct that's one um so how do you how do we we're going to go through through all three of them but how if if someone's not using beat stars for example where you can automatically split those royalties with people how can one collect those? You can't. <laughs> I mean, if it's like TuneCore, I mean, you're, you're going to have to ask for quarterly payments from my artists. And like, whose artist teams are sophisticated enough at that independent level to send out quarterly royalty payments? You, you know, <laughs> just give it up. You, you're better off just like asking for, at that point, you'd be better off asking for like a thousand dollars up front on the master side and obviously keeping your points, keeping your, your percentage on the master, but just knowing in, in, internally that you're probably not going to get it because there's really no way to, to do that. Maybe you check back in, you know, every couple of months to sort of um, say, look, you know, Spotify has generated this much on Spotify and streaming this, um, this amount of times, uh, can, can you do like a royalty um, breakdown? But like, you know, that, that person is not gonna be sophisticated enough um no not to them i'm just you know it just it, it is what it is so um i think the most ideal situation is someone's you know distributing their music through beat stars right shout out to beat stars or they're, they're uh, distributing their music to uh through distro kid for example and 
they can actually compensate you directly. So if you're owed 20% of the master, 20% goes right to your account um, at the same uh, time, you know, artists get paid. Um, so that's the master side. Um, and then the overarching caveat is what happens when you get your placement and labels are involved. Um, I think you, it's, it, you gotta start off understanding that most artists who are signed to labels are in royalty deals where they're probably getting 16 to 20 percent of the royalty so you'd be getting you know a four point producer um you're getting four out of those 16 so you're still you're really only getting four out of 100 um and it's not it's not too much actually as a point so um you know ideally you're you're dealing with someone who's distributing through distrokid or beat stars but they're streaming a lot that's an ideal world yeah, and isn't it? This is this is a hypothetical, not a, hypo, a rhetorical question. Isn't it frustrating that in 2020, Beat Stars comes out with distribution where there are automatic splits, and they're the minority doing that? Yeah, no, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's it's that's it's crazy. crazy. That's probably the biggest issue I think in the independent space is just like navigating. Because there's no way you should be doing anything and not knowing how you're going to get paid and when you're going to get paid. Like literally, that this is the only industry where I think it's so normal for you to just like sign some indie label agreement and they say you're getting accounting your your royalty statements twice a year and um, then it's like, what about the producer points you're supposed to get on that? When am I going to get those and who's going to send those out? So now we're going to ask that indie label to send out. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like it, it, the money is elusive in, in this industry for sure. So here's a follow-up question to that. Um, because now that we're talking about master royalties, if you're dealing with an artist directly, it's very easy to just say, Hey, I want 10% of the master, 20% of the master royalties. And if they're using something like a BeatStars distribution platform, they can easily just put you in 20%. It's automatically, they don't have to think about it. They don't have to deal with anything. The money's not coming out of their pockets. It's coming straight through the distributor. Yes, that's the best case scenario. When you're dealing with a label, whether independent or major, it's probably going to be on the point system where the, the label gives you a much higher advance in exchange for owning your masters and then out of the master sales they're paying you through points now points are a confusing system and someone just asked o'shea music group just asked are points the same as a percentage of gross sales and so this is the conversation where i entirely defer to carl because he knows this stuff um no that's qualified it, to speak on most times it's a percentage on net sales so it's um net after usually recording costs are recouped which is the word recoupment um, don't don't ever forget the word recruitment. Learn what that means. Um, and uh, so after, say, an artist um, paid 30K for the beat and other recording costs after that stuff gets recouped, then then points sometimes will get paid out. And I say sometimes because it's elusive. Like you still you probably got to chase them for that, too. Yeah, I know. Um... Never mind. I'm not going to talk about my royalty statements. They are low. I'll, I'll put it that way. They're low. Um, Othello, when you're dealing with an unsigned artist, what do you generally expect from from um, the master side? What kind of percentage are you comfortable with? Um, percentage wise, if it's, if I'm the only one that produced the, the record, uh, I'll say fifty percent. Like isn't that what's like it's not what everyone does? <laughs> like like isn't that what's looked at as like um you know just normal? Let's say wait, oh, Othello, are you saying if you didn't get any money? No, he's saying like royalties, like uh if it's if I'm working with an indie artist. Like how gotcha. much would I ask? Um yeah, no, nah, that's a good point. I mean, yeah, I, I and they didn't pay you, correct? Uh is that part of the question, Payne? Yeah, is that part of the question, Payne? Well, I mean, we, you know, no, no two situations are the same, but what are you generally comfortable with when someone leases a beat from you and, and they upload it to a, a distributor? What kind of money on the, what kind of percentage of the master um, royalties are you comfortable with getting? 
Oh, um, to be honest, I don't even ask for anything because because I, th- I was always told like I was pretty sure that um when you lease a beat, like I said earlier, like you don't you, you don't need to ask for uh, royalties on the back end. It's only like if they were to purchase exclusive. But I could be wrong, though. Am I wrong? Like, should I be getting royalties from my uh, from a from a, uh, when someone leases a beat and makes a song? Carl. Yes. Why oh, should? <laughs> yeah. Why, why? Why wouldn't you? You have to ask yourself why wouldn't you? No, nah, I know. I just like like I just never went back and actually like you know asked every single person that that uh you know leads to be because like it's too many so, for me you know like so now now you're getting to the practicality part of it uh huh like are are you owed royalties yes and you probably don't chase them because it's impractical yeah right um and, and I think th- I think that's how most people who lease out mass beats and you know I I, I had a, I had a producer uh who had um it was up on his beat stars I think and he at least the beat like a hundred times and now a label wants to buy it and it's like uh you know they're like yo how many times is that beat lease <laughs> and you know they're like a hundred times and um yeah and i'm thinking a hundred times like what the are you do you even know who's leasing your beats like what what happens after that i'm and that's something i'm curious about like um is it just simply a transaction are you guys is it and this is something for you i, I guess pain i'm taking your spot now uh when someone sells your beat, uh, or when you sell your beat from your BeatStars account and someone buys it, um, what happens? Is that the end of the transaction? Are you taking metadata? Are you getting information from them so you can track the song? What happens? Well, and I mean, I was I was smiling during the, the Othello conversation because I this is something that is such a great conversation. Um, yeah, someone said they need to replace me, man. I'm learning too, though. Like, well, we're all learning, and, and I'm not laughing because we don't know. I'm I'm <laughs> laughing because it's such a complicated situation, and that's exactly uh, what Carl was saying. Um, if someone licenses a beat from me, nine out of ten times, I don't know what happens to that record. A lot of times, artists will contact me, send me the record, um, you know, ask me what I think about it. Cool. I'll, I'll ask them when does it drop, because I want to know. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I I can't expect because this might be their first song ever, and they might not know anything about the the process of registration of royalty payments. They might not even be signed up to a distributor yet. They don't they don't know the difference between a Beat Stars or one of their other distributors that don't allow splits. Um, they don't know the. They don't know what a PRO is. They might not even be signed up to to, to a PRO. So, <laughs> yeah. for me to chase them down, you know, if if I license, you know, three hundred beats a month, I can't chase three hundred people down. It's not realistic. So, mm-hmm. isn't that frustrating for a producer who might have a lot of? We're leaving a lot of money on the table just because we don't have the time and the capacity to chase everyone down and say hey did you register this properly are the metadata correct did you give me my splits okay you you didn't give me my splits are you doing the quarterly accounting on the master side of the royalties it's it's a lot it's overwhelming i just just thought of an idea maybe oh uh i'll just say this real quick i usually when someone purchases a beat they get an email from me you know thanking them or whatever maybe Maybe I should just do an automatic and like everyone else just do an automatic email. Just like, you know, here's my information. Set it up. You know, um, I would appreciate it if you do. Well, like you said, they're supposed to, though. Right. So. I don't, right. Like, or, yeah, yeah I, you know, I think maybe maybe if you could be proactive and other producers, and be, maybe when you send them that thank you email or whatever email it is, there's like a form um, or even before they push purchase, like there's a form that they got to put like the song information in or something like that. So you can track it. Um, I guess it would have to be after the fact, just cause they'll, you know, they'll release the song after they purchase, but um, you know, so, so you can, I guess, follow or track that song and, um, and, you, and you could quickly, uh, you know, may, maybe do what you need to do to register that record across the different mediums and, or assist in, in helping getting that song properly 
um, you know, formulated for everybody to be successful. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, but but it, that, that's a bit aggressive. You know, I think, you know, artists and it's just such a weird, it's, there's still that sort of weird energy, I think, between producers and artists when it comes to doing business, even with the most produ- progressive artists and producers. It's 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 not when nobody's robot, especially in hip hop, the hip hop hip hop genre, which mostly I like, guess beat stars. It, you know, it's a pla- platform where hip hop beats are sold. You know, there's still that that weird dynamic where um, you know no one's really looking at this like, hey, um, uh, you know, they're taking metadata, they're they're viewing um, some of these forms that they're people are asking to be. They're not viewing them the same way that maybe a startup company would. They're probably like, this is a hassle. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, even for me, sometimes it's it feels like a hassle to go through that whole registration process and sign split sheets and everything. But and I'm and I might take my time doing it because I have other pressing uh, concerns. But it's just I I appreciate it from an unsigned artist because I know that they're learning and they're covering their bases and you know who knows some someone with that level of of uh commitment could could go far um it, i think it, what my bad go ahead me, can, can i uh and, and i'm looking at there's certain things i, I just want to like just one thing i want to point out from someone to put in the uh, chat sorry about that pain um someone talked about part of the lease agreement should state that the registrations must be completed and all info sent back to me before the record is released. Sounds good. That's not practical. It's all about like, you know, really, really being practical with hip hop artists and musicians. And, you know, if you say that to an artist or, or somebody else, they're going to be like, what? Are we? I don't even know. I don't know. You know, we can't keep, you know, I, I think the community must um, understand that the, a lot of these things are outside stakeholders. And I think this table needs to be, um, these tables need to be filled with just as many people at the labels and at these other companies to make sure that these issues are being heard because they're crucial stakeholders in terms of changing their platforms and the way they operate to incorporate producers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And my so Othello brought up the idea of automating a, an email response to all of his beat buyers just saying here's my information personally i i can't think of i'm also um all over the place because i'm reading the chat and i'm trying to moderate this panel uh but i I, right now if someone put a gun to my head and said come up with a a solution i i'd be dead because i don't have a solution um beyond that i think i think what you proposed othello is just sending your information just saying look here's my sound exchange number Here's my publisher and writer information. You know, if you are going to release the beat and or, or release the song, here's the information you need to register it properly. Yeah. Period. And here it is. And uh, do with it what you will, because at very least, you're going to let them know that you that here's your information. You take the it seriously, and then at very least they can um they can they can choose to do it they don't have to chase you down for it you're making it easy for them and whatever happens from that point happens but i i I think your point is god this chat i think your point is is definitely taken carl when you say you don't want to play whack-a-mole because yeah if if i i could spend my whole 24 hours every day chasing people down trying to get everybody to do everything by the book and I wouldn't have time to make beats and I wouldn't be happy. So yeah. there's that. I mean, we choose our battles, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like we said before the well, like I said, um, the only times I, I can, that I remember actually going back to track a song is when, when the artist reaches out to me and they ask for a pack, like let's say if it's an indie, you know, let let's say there's a it's an indie guy. If they reach out to me, I know to you know follow up eventually. Or if they drop an album, I'll be on the lookout and see if I'm on there. But like when it comes to like the individual, like everyday people purchasing on B Stars, like no, I I don't go back and you know and track to see if they if they set up the uh, if they set up you know all my information when they upload. 
And, you know, I'm just, I had to just point out one comment. Someone just said, has Carl ever seen anyone go to jail for a music industry related <laughs> issue? Yeah. Buffo and the beat, I don't know where your head's at, but get, get in the game. <laughs> yeah. Hey, to, to speak to that though, also, there's this fear around, shout out to Buffo on the beat. I'm just surprised that the question didn't have anything, any, any sexual undertones, um, cause that's usually his style, but a lot of people are having these concerns about lawsuits. I mean, I'll, I'll have someone contact me and say, hey, has anybody else licensed this beat before I don't want to get sued? Or, hey, um, I just put a beat out, but I didn't register it for a copyright. I don't want to get sued. Um, or, hey, what what's the percentage that you need on this collab? I don't want to get sued. Mm -hmm. I personally have never known anybody to get sued. How how common are lawsuits in this world, Carl? Not, not common at all. And I, I almost laugh at the idea of like someone, especially if they're not 100% right in, in their mind. And even if you are 100% right, you got to have the proof to prove it. And, um, you know, when someone says they're ready to go to court, they're going to sue someone. It's like, no, you're not. 99% um, of the time, I, you don't have either the funds you don't have the emotional or sort of mental willpower to do so. It's emo lawsuits are, you know, they take a lot out of you. You know, you, they take a lot out of your pockets and, and and out of your spirit. Like no one likes going to court, and if you do, you're probably a sick person. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think um, it just doesn't happen at, at all. Yeah. Yeah, it goes back to the, the cost benefit analysis. Yeah, Sweetie Jenkins. Yeah, many people ask me all the time for a sample beat. They'll be like, um, and I tell them the sample every time, but uh, they'll be like, yeah, like, am I going to get sued for this sample? And I just be realistic with them. I'm like, if the song is not, you know, on top 100, if it's not on the radio, like, the chances are just super duper low. But, you know, if you still want to clear, you know, like, I'm not going to tell you not to, but I'm just saying, like, what are the chances? Like, I don't see any of those like, you know, superstars coming down to you, like, and, you know, going through a whole lawsuit just for, you know, 50 streams or 100 stream song. Like. Well, yeah, well, it, it's simple math. It'll cost you more in legal fees than it would to get what you got back out of you know, suing someone who has 10,000 streams. Yeah. You'd literally be paying more for the lawsuit than you'd be getting in a judgment. Mm hmm. Yeah, so it's an L regardless. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I see people commenting small claims court, but again, small claims court means you have to serve somebody, and if they live in another state and God forbid another country, how are you gonna do that? Anyway, um let, let, let's move on from the whole suing thing and uh let's talk about um yeah, let's continue the conversation about royalties because we already had a conversation about the master side, which is the majority of the streaming royalties. Um, up next is performance royalties. So we talked about how to get royalties on the master side, which is through split systems on your distributors. Uh, for example, BeatStars is one of the few distributors that allows for automatic splits. With performance royalties, how do producers make sure that they're getting paid? Um, that's a bit easier, and I think a bit more in your control. Uh, you know, you think of ASCAP, BMI, those are PROs. Um, you can avoid those songs for sure. Um, you go up, sorry, you can uh, go in and register those songs. You know, you can. It doesn't, you don't have to be, um, in particular, a brain surgeon to do so. Um, you know, it's it's not the easiest process. I think you can definitely get tripped up, but I think after you've done it a couple times. You watch enough YouTube videos, um, you know, you can learn how to register your songs. Um, YouTube education is a real thing, man. You know, yeah. you can attend V-Star Summit, um, you know, watch YouTube videos and read articles all day long. And I think you're, you're probably getting as full of education in the music business as anyone else who probably goes to school uh, in, in regards to the nuts and bolts. Um, so... You you go learn how to register those songs. So it's you know ASCAP BMI if you're in in, in um in Canada, SoCan, and 
you know, um, the, the problem with that is it's, it's sort of a regional thing. Regional, I mean, by the United States. So usually ASCAP and BMI are collecting United States royalties. And right off the bat, you should be thinking, oh, crap, what about the rest of the uh, royalties across the globe? This is a global sport. Um, how am I going to collect my performance royalties outside of my region? That's when the question comes in, um, whether you should partner with a, a song trust, a, um, a beat stars, district, uh, you know, administration, um, you know, all bunch of other companies have an administration arm that try to help you collect your royalties globally, uh, performance royalties yeah, globally. Beat stars has one now too, um, with Sony. Yeah. Sony ATV. Yeah. And actually the next panel is going to be with the Sony ATV, uh, signed producer and a Sony ATV rep. Um, so if you really want to dig deeply into the publishing world, don't miss the next uh, session because that's what it's going to be about. Okay, so we've talked about collecting on the master side. We've talked about collecting on the, the PRO side, a.k.a. Um, the, the uh, performance royalties. Um, and performance royalties falls under the publishing umbrella. The last royalty we're going to talk about also falls under the publishing umbrella, which is mechanicals. And mechanicals... Man, I would say mechanicals are the most misunderstood royalty. Right. For for me, they are at least. I still can't. Even the word mechanicals refers to something that doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, right. Mechanicals used to refer to physical things, you know. Um, or, or uh, what are those those player pianos, the reels, mechanicals. Um. Now mechanicals have to do with a stream, and a stream is totally virtual. There's nothing mechanical about it. So already it's confusing. But what is a mechanical? How do producers get it when their beats are streamed? Yeah, mechanical is, I'd say, one of the most elusive royalties. Um, there's a lawsuit right now. Uh, TuneCore is getting sued by Round Hill Music for um, a lot of money. I know it's in the millions. I forgot the actual tag. But... It's um, a dist uh, essentially TuneCore, um, you know, operating as a, di a distributor, but really not paying out the mechanical royalty. Um, and but you know, it, it leads to the bigger question: like, who's paying? Who pays out the mechanical royalty? Um, and you know, labels will pay out mechanical royalties oftentimes, especially if you're not with a administrator. You'll, you'll they'll send you like a form. And you sign in, sign up for their system, and they're supposed to be sending mechanical royalties over to you. Um, you know, if you if you're not really operating at that major label uh, level, um, then it really is tricky about who's paying your mechanical royalty. Um, but you know, the, there's entities out there. Uh, the Harry Fox uh, agency is is the one who um, who's supposed to collect and administer that mechanical license and and sort of divvy it out. Um, but there's no one way, there's no one answer in, in regards to how a sole individual collects their mechanical royalty. That's why you partner up with a song trust, with the Beat Stars administration. Um, you know, I, I've so, in Beat Stars administration, I think they're back, they are backed by Sony's uh, a system, correct? And it's a great, it's as good as a system as you're gonna get. Um, so you get to see all your royalties worldwide. You'll collect your your mechanicals then. But if you're not partnered with an admin company, it's going to be pretty hard for you to collect your mechanical royalty. So I think that's what is um, <laughs> really, really, really frustrating is that a lot of the answers that we have as far as royalty collection is that it's damn near impossible. Um so someone asked what holy shit sorry a bird just a hawk no less not just a regular bird a hawk just <laughs> flew right at my window it, it seems to be okay but it's not happy about that i don't know if there was an animal by it anyway um so we we know harry fox agency is one of the the uh agencies responsible for collecting and, and distributing mechanical royalties Someone asked about music reports. What is music reports role in, in mechanical royalty collection? Uh, I, I don't use music report, uh, music reports in 
I really don't dabble too deeply into the collection space um, for the mechanical royalty. Um, I think it's, once again, I think it's easier for someone to um, dab dabble into like a, a, a well-known administrator and just get it all in one bucket as opposed to worry about who's going to register in each sort of arm to get these things. So you want to you, you want to make sure that uh, if you can co consolidate, it's probably better. It's like um, you think about um, like a student loan payment, for example, it's like consolidation somehow makes that payment lower and easier to get. You just want to pay one thing. Um, I think collecting your publish publishing royalties for the most part, if I could, I would just I would rather do that in one spot. And that's the convenience of it. You may be willing to give away 10 percent of your royalties and they don't own it. You know, most admin companies don't or 20 percent, whatever it is. And, um, you know, you get all your you get all your royalties. And it sounds like that's what you did, Othello. You just signed to a, a admin deal and, and they are dealing with this stuff for you. So I think a lot of people end up getting frustrated. Producers get frustrated, but there are some ways around it. And what, so are, are you, um, do, do you feel more covered now that you have a publishing administrator, uh, Othello? Yeah, they, uh, what's it called? They collect like on YouTube. I have one with, uh, what's it called? There's two companies, one named Broadband TV, and they collect my royalties for YouTube. And uh, Song Trust, um, yeah, I'm registered with them as well. So yeah, I do feel more com more covered because usually when, like I said, when someone usually when there's an artist that uh, that I know is putting a, a song out and they reach out to me and they want my information, I go through Song Trust and I register it, register it through them. So I'm I'm definitely going to be asking a lot of these questions too. Um, for, uh, in the next panel with, with um, Sony ATV uh, so we can figure out, you know, from a different perspective what, what their take is on anything or everything that we've talked about. Um, here's a general question about um, agreements. So whether it's a lease agreement, whether it's an exclusive agreement from a major or independent label, a lot of times producers just don't know where to start and i've and you've seen the horror stories you've heard the horror stories about producers or rappers whether it's meg the stallion whoever it is signing agreements that they admit they don't fully understand i'm passionate about this okay do you want to just go off now because because we got time <laughs> well i'll just say you know it's the, it's a simple idea in business like cutting out the middleman and i think the only way you know how to do that is if you know where and how royalties are getting collected. Um, think about it. Um, when you sign with a quote unquote publisher, if they don't have the ability to collect the actual royalties, they are a middleman, right? You, you sign with Sony ATV, they have the ability to not only finance you, but also um, collect all the royalties and, and that's what they do. But when you sign with um, some random publishing company, that isn't a bona fide publisher uh, in a sense that they actually, sorry, the better word is you sign with a publisher who is also not an administrator, right? That is where I start getting weird about why I would do that. Like, why wouldn't I just go direct to source? And if I want to cut someone in on my publishing, you know, that could be a separate contract about, you know, you know if they help me get placements or yada, yada, yada. All right, cool. You know, I'll break you off a piece of the publishing you know, on that split sheet. But I, the idea of giving away your admin rights to someone who can't collect is absurd to me. Um, mm -hmm. It's done and I've had to do it before. I've, I've seen agreements um, and there's a bunch of uh, rappers, for example, who like signing producers to these sort of agreements. Sometimes it's beneficial in the sense that, um, especially if it's early in your career, um, you know, someone, they, they, they're more incentivized to pick your beats, use your beats, and, you know, in that sense, you both make more money. And I think I'm OK with that. Um, but, you know, in, in a perfect world, um, I know myself, if I was a producer, I would not be willing to give away administration rights to someone who doesn't have a portal, 
who isn't the uh, direct administrator and there's no transparency in my business. You you always get screwed with each level of transparency you give up to um, your money, you, you get screwed every single time. So if you're asking yourself like, how am I gonna get paid? Like, where do you collect from? Um, where, and then they're like, oh no, we use cobalt. Where it's just like, oh, if you use cobalt, um, you know, what, what are they providing for that? Are they gonna be landing you placements? And then it goes back to the old age hustle about someone just selling you, upselling you on something that they just can't do or that just not real not realistic. So um I, this business, the production business is no is no different than any other business. I think if you can go direct to source as much, much as possible, um you should do that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just a pitch in too. Like I'll just tell all the producers in the chat. Um like I was offered a um like a publishing deal from this guy and I remember me and Carl was just kind of laughing about it because we were like, who does this guy really know? Like, yeah, because it's like he wants to take my percentages, but it's like, what are you really like? What are you going to really do for me? They're like, we can send out your beats, you know, we can put you in the room and they, you know, they make all these promises, but it's like in the end, like I'm not going to um, just um, turn on my mic. There's no point in me giving up my percentage to someone that I can do it on my own. You know, it's like and, there's no rush. And if they help on a placement, I don't think anyone has any problem with giving, breaking that person off with publishing. Uh huh. Like, a hundred percent, right? Like I think everybody yeah. here, someone actually goes out there and gets that placement. Um, you say, all right, cool. Like you just you you, you did that. <laughs> let's I'm a break. Let's 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 break bread here. But to sign these massive two year, year deals, year like, deals yeah. Um, yeah. and th that's th all of a sudden you don't. And you know, someone just said, Carl, what's the best negotiation negotiating advice you can give? Most of the negotiations aren't worth it. That's the best negotiation advice. So there are all types of agreements out there. Some of them are, are for publishing deals. Some of them are for publishing admin. Some of them are for beat leases. Some of them are for, you know, placements. Now, a lot of producers will just sign or just agree and not necessarily understand the content. And then once they understand it, it's too late. Rappers do that too. We see it all the time, and we're now these these um you know Migos allegedly signed one of these deals. That's what they're saying. Well, he sued. He's well, he's suing his lawyer. Right, right. So that's a little more complicated. Uh, yeah, because it was a. It, it, it's it's what you said. It just it's um in that sense, he's basically saying that what well, the case is um. Uh, the lawyer represented both sides of the coin. They represented the the label and they represented the talent. And um, right there is a conflict of interest. And you know those things weren't necessarily uh, uh, disclosed. Disclosed, and um, you know there were fees taken, like sort of on both sides. Just just sort of the nasty undertone of the the, the music business was was definitely there. Um, and I don't know the truth truth in that case. So that these are all just just read from the court, um, the the lawsuits that's publicly available. Um, but it, it is a common scenario where where you know that lawyer that is recommended to you is the one who's trying to urge you to sign that deal, and they're they're selling you that snake oil. Like man, the, these guys can really get you placements, man. They're gonna they're gonna change the game. And then you look at their track record, and there's nothing ever that that would suggest that they, they can do any of the things that they're talking about it's, for me it's, it's it's all simple stuff i don't think um i don't think any of this stuff is 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 quote unquote brain surgery i think you need to decode the matrix in your head relax and really just look at the facts the facts are always the facts so we got ill mind in the chat i want to tell a story um about facts. ill mind indirectly um because this has some some very serious uh, legal implications. So I had a producer contact me and, and send me some loops. I didn't know who he was. He said, hey, I made these loops. Um, collab on them with me. He didn't say what percentage he wanted, which was a red flag. Because if you don't know until the end of it, they might want 50. They might want 60. And they all they did was provide a loop. So anyway, I'm listening to the loops. I don't know why. I listened to one of the loops. I'm like, now nah, this is this is mad familiar. So I looked it up. It was made by Illmind. 
and I've known Ilmine for 10, 12 years, like personally, like we met, we've been on panels together. And had I used this loop and not known that that was an Ilmine sample, I'm walking myself into a really bad legal situation because I'm infringing on Ilmine's copyright thinking that everything's all good. And something really bad could happen to me as a result of something I didn't know anything about. A lot of this stuff is happening now. Um, and I don't think the producer community really understands how bad it can get. How bad can this really get? Uh, it can definitely get bad. But I, I also think that it, it's, it, gets re- it gets worse when... I don't think there's real precedent being set. Because I think this stuff is happening so much, even from popular producers who are... That's just make it remaking loops, doing all sorts of nasty behavior, and it's kind of going unchecked. Like there's these moments where everyone maybe calls out someone or you know feels crazy, and then you know you hear it again from another producer or another. So like these are community issues, and you know I think these are conversations that um, you know got, have to be had amongst you know that th- this community. But um, yeah, it can get it can get real bad. I don't see how that is acceptable in any right and um you know if the song's super super successful um you know it 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 just it makes it a headache for everybody a lot of times those things get settled because a person's like well all right if i just get cut in on my point and my publishing like all right and i get my co-producer credit or producer credit i guess no harm no foul right like it is what it is but um and you know, I, yeah, I was in I was in a recent situation where I had to represent someone in that in, in that situation, and um, yeah, it's, it's it's bad. This is a community issue. I, I feel like this is one of those things where um, you know everyone everyone's going to get hurt in this community if, if this is what what people are doing to each other. Yeah, like that producer's brave to use a producer as like as like high industry as Ilman and think he could possibly get away with it, like. No, he's crazy. <laughs> like you're, yeah, you got to be brave yeah. to do that, I mean, man. Yeah, some savage. Yeah, and I think so. We got Ilmine in the chat saying, you know, when he takes a stand against stuff like this, a lot of new producers will attack him as a as a hater. Um, that's another <laughs> part of the, you know, to echo what Carlos says. That's a community conversation we need to have because. I just really don't think people understand how bad it can get, not just for the people that that are the victims of this, but for the the person that's facilitating, you know, the person that sent me the loop, it can be bad for him. I mean, and here's here's like, here's the thing. People already don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like this, but I think there is almost an emphasis from a rs and people selecting beats in songs that like people already don't want loops in those beats because they're all know there's always sort of like are there the first question i get asked are, are there co-producers sampler samples loops yada 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 because it makes the paperwork messy and you know you know it, it just it, it holds things up so there's all if you have a producer like a ill mind or someone else who's like hand, getting that placement to you divvying out your stuff and like th- that is you don't want to ruin that for the rest of the community because um you know, p- people i think people are, are are likely to go back to a, a spot where it's like you know like do i this is a great beat and a great song but you know uh we we can't trust this producer or we can't trust this this situation because this, this happened last time or you know there was a loop in here that was unclear and I didn't get told until you know after the song was released. That stuff that's like an everyday occurrence, and it, it makes everyone look stupid. You know, it's happened to me, and in some like I've had clients where they didn't tell me until after that there was a loop, like after the thing was out. You know, I, you know everything, and I'm like, dude, what? Like, what? What kind of omission is that? Like, that is somebody's loop. Now we all, now everybody looks crazy. Someone's liable to come come out and be like, yo, Carl. You know, he says he's for the community, but. He allowed one of his producers to use my loop and get, you know, 100 percent of the credit. You make everybody look crazy. Yeah. um, And then on the flip side of that, um, I recently saw a producer giving out free sample packs that were full of uncleared samples that he got from old songs, um, (laughs) which is, you know, that it is is. royalty free on top of it. 
Okay, so this, Othello, thank you for saying that. That This is where my issue comes in. This this is where I, I start having a problem. Um, the producer included the statement in the pact that said, remember, you don't need to clear the samples unless you made a big placement. So now we have, now we have producers who are not only putting you in a bad position legally and putting you in legal danger, but they're also giving you legal advice that is 128,000 million billion percent wrong. All right. I have a question for you before I, I know we're winding down. I have a question for you, uh, pain one. And yeah, you know, I know ill minds in here too. The royalty free loop. I, 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 I'm at this point where I don't even like the word anymore. Like you describe pain. Tell me what you believe a royalty free loop is when someone markets something as a royalty free loop. I mean, for me, I read the agreement. If it says, royalty free except in the case of a placement i know what that means if it's set my issue has never really been with um with the term royalty free it's always been with with either the agreement not being there or the agreement omitting information so if i read an agreement and it tells me you can say i love the agreements that are thorough that say you can use this on a on a beat license, I don't care. If you if you sell it to a major, I want 10, 15, 20%. Okay, great, cool. I'm just gonna put this on beat stars. It's probably not gonna get placed. If it does get placed, you get your 20%, everybody's happy. Um, I've not ever, because I don't trust a lot of people for the reasons that I just said. I've never been in a, in a situation, and I think Carl, you have, where somebody sent me a, a royalty-free loop and then all of a sudden, come back and said, wait, that's not royalty free. I see you're getting money off of it. Something's going on. I, I, I want a piece. Right. And, and here's why I think that's the problem with the word royalty free. Um, that's why I think there needs to be another name for it because I think so many, I've had that, that, that situation happen and people are like, no, nah, it's royalty free. You know, I got it from this, you know, I got it from Luberman or I got it, from this, that, this place, or and then you know we look up the terms, and you know it, it it's probably not royalty free. It's it's royalty free if it's not with a you know major label or it doesn't get placed. And you know I just think there's a better word for that. I don't know. I I think that's my whole gripe with the whole royalty free thing. It's like we're making it way too complicated. Like call it I don't know <laughs> royalty free before the placement loops like. I, I don't know. Yeah. Like it, 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 it is confusing. I think to everybody. When, I think when we're calling something royalty free, when when in actuality it's not. Yeah, uh, Payne. Do you know what arcade is? Like the vocal chops, like its output. Arcade. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yep. I use. Aren't it. those royalty free? Because I was getting a placement, and they were asking like, "What preset did I use?" And I'm like, I had to go to arcade and like find what sounds i was actually using like they really wanted to know like exactly what vocal chops i was using but i'm like does it matter like it was arcade they're all royalty free like i here's here's my thing with with that question i understand it because i think a ton of people it's happened to me before and i i'm in the producer community i see the conversations happening I see tons of of producers saying, I'm sampling this, but you would never know because I'm reversing it and flipping it. I'm like, hey, if you want to play Russian roulette with, with, with your um, life and, and your career, that's your choice. Because people are saying it right now in the chat. You got to flip them. You got to make them different, this and that. All right, cool. You can still get sued. You, you really think that people aren't going to figure it out? They can figure it out. Maybe you'll you'll slide a little bit. But it could happen. And, you know, it's it's like jaywalking. You're probably not going to get a ticket for it, but you might. Um, so if, if, a, if a, and I've seen this happen too with producers where, the, where they'll just say, you know, yeah, I used this royalty-free sound. And maybe they didn't. Maybe they're, maybe they're saying that just because they think they flipped a non-royalty-free sample so much that they're trying to get out of sharing their split. And so the label 
needs to know exactly what preset you use so they can verify it themselves. I understand, and I think it has to do with how um, how how crazy the current practices in the community are, and how there are just really no rules now and 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 you know a lot of it, it comes from just everyone having access which i don't think is a bad thing but we're we're gonna see a lot more distrust with these scenarios constantly coming up in the producer community yeah sorry so i have another question uh because this is like really similar so when it comes to midis i'm still trying to understand that whole concept too because i understand yeah you can put up like you know uh like how you can take a midi and um just put like find a sound and make a loop out of it like so midi producers are supposed to get like a percentage of the song as well i mean technically if they if they're asking for one yeah because so midi isn't an actual sound correct me yeah. if i'm wrong carl so a midi isn't an isn't a sound so you don't necessarily have to clear the master because there is no master but it is a composition in the sense that it's made up of notes and, and all, everything that that qualifies as a comp composition which is a copyright in and of itself so they they someone who makes midis is a hundred percent able to claim a composition copyright the only um, thing is though like how do you prove that because like it could be a coincidence to use the same melody, like that is possible. But if you put a different sound on it, like how is it really this? Like, you know, like is it really the same? Like, yes, you know, melody, I guess. Yeah, yeah. the uh, The answer is yes. It's like if you take a sheet music and you play it with a different instrument, isn't it the same melody? Yeah. Right. So it's it's the same concept. Like you know. If someone gives you a melody and you just literally change that melody, you put that uh, the MIDI in, you know, it might be horns, but then you just say, nah, I'm going to use some synths. But you use the same exact uh, underlying written music. Um, you know, it, you know it, it, it is what it is. I think, Payne, you're, you're, you're right. Um, you know, there's, you won't have to really clear that on the master side. It's really just a composition side, the publishing. Okay, so even with cork progressions, because I thought you can't like copyright chord progressions. Like anyone can replay um, like, chord progression. I, I won't get into that because Katy Perry, <laughs> the case for example, she won, and you know, I think a lot of people were like, "Those were literally basic chords." It was like, "Eh, eh, 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 eh." eh. For and, dark and she won the copyright case. Uh -huh. yeah, so. Um, I, I, I wish I could say uh, <laughs> yes or no, or there's some sort of, I, I would, I would stay, stay, uh, stay abreast of these issues that are happening right now. Okay. Um, so someone just asked, uh, what your thoughts, Carl, were on the blurred line situation. Apparently the, the consensus in the chat is that they are mad about that decision. Yeah. I mean, I, I think they should have talked to more people who make music um, in, in, in that scenario, because I think people who, um, the people who make the music have the best vantage point to really sort of, I think, decide on whether something was copied or, or, or not, um, or, and, and whether something's good to protect through co via copyright or not. Because there, you know, when you think about it, there are genres of music uh, and sub genres of music that kind of sound the same and similar. They use different chord, same chord structure, uh, a lot of the same drums, a lot of the same uh, synths and, and energy. Uh, and, um, you know, how could you sort of go into each of these songs and moments and protect one and and and, and then sort of, you know, give them, it, it's just a weird thing, man. So I don't know. I, I thought that the bass line, uh, the note that they were sort of um, saying that was protectable, I didn't necessarily think it was protectable. I think a lot of people in the industry have a big issue with that. It's gonna, you know, it feels like it, it's hurting creativity um, and limiting creativity. That's sort of the buzzword when people say to that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just think, you know, for, for the time being, we just have to operate in a space where um, that's possible. That's why a lot of times um, when I have an artist who signs a record label deal, and we say we have all the clearances done and yada, yada, yada. They'll st still send the music to a musicologist. And the musicologist will say, um, mm, 
that song sounds like this or that, and you know, we don't know about this. Are you are you willing to take that risk? You know, if you are, then that risk will be on you. So it's it's getting sticky. That's annoying. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah, I think it is. It is scary. And then you know, who is a musicologist anyway, if not just another individual? And who's hiring them? And who's who are they? Who you know? Who's putting money in their pocket? And therefore, who's going to sway their decision one way or another? Um, I want to ask a, a question that's straight out of my uh, history as a producer, which is about my first major placement. Um, the reason I'm asking is because this scenario keeps coming up in the lives of a lot of producers. When I um, first got my major placement, I was told by the label that I needed to hurry up and sign, otherwise I wasn't going to make it on the album. In retrospect, that was probably a lie. But because I rushed, that meant I didn't have as much time to converse with my lawyer. I didn't have enough time to understand all the points of the of the of the agreement and now that i understand it i look back on that agreement and think i should have gotten a point bump i should have gotten a higher advance but they rushed me and i shouldn't have even listened to that so what advice do you give producers who find themselves in a situation where a label or an artist tries to rush them through the signing of an agreement as a way to just get them to to really i guess get caught slipping it's such a scumbag tactic of negotiating like just to a lot of these kids are like 17, 18 years old. You know, you're like, um, <laughs> you're gonna ruin the biggest opportunity you've ever had in your life. You know, if you don't sign this contract, that's um, that's super, uh, you know, advantageous to them. You know, it, it's such a bad way to, to, to do business, but it happens and it's such a real, real thing. Um, you know, honestly, I, I, more than likely, if you just say, you know, I'm sending it to my attorney, especially if they're familiar with that attorney, maybe they sort of contact that attorney and say, you know, we, we are looking to kind of speed this up. Can, can we, you know, what, what do you need from us? Um, but, you know, there, there has been scenarios where I've seen people, you know, lose out on placements by trying to negotiate too much or, um, you know, really, you know, some songs might be that last, it might be the last song on a project and they've been thinking twice about putting that song or another song on and the other song is already cleared at a lower, you know, and they get to maybe save a little bit more of the budget because they have London on the track. They got ill mind on it, you know. And, you know, ill mind, ill mind's like, I need, I need my twenty k. <laughs> no, but you know what, what, whatever it is, um, I, I, I just think that you know, you, you have to be able to. It's not a negotiation if you can't live without it. So you have to be able to sort of, if you are saying like, yo, I want to talk to my lawyer, and you know, we'll be back in a day or two. Um, and you're okay with the possibility of it, it, it not going through, then you know you made your you made your decision, and you you got to be able to live with that. But if if you really think this 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 thing is um, the placement that's going to change your life, and you don't want to, I, I guess I guess you could sign it. But it goes back to again knowing that you might have um, you know missed out on a couple uh, negotiation points, and you could have got a bump or two on, on some things. So we're we're about to run out of time. One more time, I appreciate both of you, Othello and uh, Carl, folks, for spending the time and uh, educating and sharing your your experiences. Um, real quick, Othello first, and then Carl. How do people find you? How do people get your beats? Not in Carl's case. How do people get your representation? Not in Othello's case. Um, basically, how do people find you outside of today's session so that they can continue to um, follow you, get your updates, and so forth. I'm up double beast on all platforms. So yeah. Thank you for yeah. having me too, Pain and B Stars. Yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate my, you. My, I have it right under uh, my picture in the bottom left corner, ESQ folks, uh, on all platforms. 